go along with it. And the second catchphrase was go for broke. Uh, Hawaiian slang for go all out, give 100%. Uh, popularized by the boys in the all volunteer 100th Battalion from Hawaii. And this, so so this, this was patriotic self sacrifice in the name of proving one's loyalty. And in the naivete of my adolescence, this didn't seem quite right. Uh, it seemed to be something missing. And so when we discovered, uh, well, and we would ask our parents' generation, the Nisa, you know, mom, dad, why, why didn't you uh, resist this thing? Why didn't you fight back? And they would say, well, you know, you weren't born then. Uh, times were different. You don't know how it was. You can't apply your Berkeley civil rights activism of the 60s to those times. You weren't there, so you can't know. You can't judge us. Um, so when we discovered the Heart Mountain resistors uh, through friends of mine, it was like discovering a missing link. Uh, and it was revalidation for myself that the Constitution was not an invention of the 60s, and that resistance against the camps was not some figment of my overheated imagination. Um, so what you saw was the result of a 20-year investigation. Uh, there, there are some threads in the field I want to just tie together real quickly. It's really uh, important or, or significant to me to screen it here in Seattle, in the International District, where you know 7,000 from this state were excluded. You saw the scenes at the Assembly Center, our hometown concentration camp, of course, with the Puyallup Fairgrounds, and then off to Minidoka, Idaho. Um, Fred Idie, uh, as you mentioned, he was uh, at McNeil, of course, McNeil Island, the prison in south of Tacoma. Uh, Fred Idie was electrocuted, showing his replacement how to pull these big switches in the powerhouse. And it's, it's said that his, um, his footprints are burned at the concrete uh, at McNeil mm -hmm. Island. Uh, you saw Jim Akutsu and Bill Hosokawa. Uh, both went to Broadway High School, which, was, which is now Seattle Central Community College. Uh, Jim, gosh, I mean, he lived at, at the uh, at the Yakima. His, his father's shoe shop was in the Yakima Hotel, which is Sixth and Weller, which is where the Ocean City Restaurant is now. Uh, Jim's mother was, uh, as you heard, she, you know, uh, she was a Harborview Hospital when she took her own life. Uh, so this is this is a very local story. Uh, it's very, you know, it touches here in Seattle. A lot of the guys you saw were from Mountain View, California, San Jose, Cupertino, Frank Emming from Los Angeles, um, Heart Mountain, well, maybe, maybe San Jose went to, to Heart Mountain, was a, was, whereas Seattle uh, evacuees were sent to Idaho. In Idaho. So I want to um, give you the opportunity to ask any questions you have. Um, again, uh, before I open up the questions, I guess, what was most important in, in, in the, uh, I guess the happy outcome of making this movie was to, for the children of, of the resistors, the children of Dave Kawamoto and Yosh Kuromi and Frank Emmy, to uh, finally frame for them the story of their fathers, that they knew that their father had been in camp and they had been in prison. Why was he in prison? Maybe he'd done something wrong. And, and so they didn't, they didn't quite understand that whole story. And so by, by framing their story as a classic example of American civil disobedience in the 20th century, they could finally see the framework for their father's uh, actions and understand more clearly the kind of the, the guts, the courage it took for them to, to uh, stand up for a principle, not just for themselves, but for the community as la at large, although the community didn't appreciate it at the time. So with that, um, I want to again um, thank uh, Tomio Moriguchi for inviting me to kick off this film series, Nikkei Heroes, and uh, to help kick, you know, establish the Nagomi Tea House, what a wonderful venue this is for, for film screenings for the community, and to ask you if you have any, any now questions. Stacy? Or you? Yes, Elaine? Yes. Uh, can you tell the rest of the story? Uh, what happened? And it seemed like the Nisei and the Sansei were the ones involved. Yes. Yeah. I mean, 
what you saw the last scenes were shot in Fresno, California, the Central California District Council of JACL. And they were the most kind of most most conservative, you know, Nisei farmers in California who held on to the belief that, you know, uh, it was the veterans who who who, who fell, you know, sacrificed during the war, who were the true heroes, and that these boys, these draft resistors, were you know, no, no more than delinquents or draft dodgers. You know, um, some of them were, they believe, still believe to this day, sympathetic to Japan, and you saw they were not. Um, and they were offended by the idea of uh, people like Andy Babucci of Sacramento coming forward to say we should, you know, kind of try to reconcile, heal this division, um, pass a resolution for JACL to apologize. And the apology just totally offended them, the idea. And um, here in Seattle, people like Cherry Kinoshita were leading this uh, resolution number seven for JACL to, um, at first, kind of acknowledge all wartime resistance, both the, 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 the Hard Mountain resistors, but also the, the fellows at Tule Lake, whose story I couldn't get into. And, I've taken some heat for that because we don't address the, the true no-no boys. These, these guys are often called no-no boys, but they're not. They were, as you saw, they were yes-yes boys. They answered yes in the loyalty questionnaire. And the no-no boys, like Jim Okutsu was a no-no boy, and John Okada's novel is titled No-No Boy, um, were segregated to the camp at Tule Lake, California. And theirs, theirs was a much more troubling story that I, again, I had to choose to narrow down our story to just these guys. And so Resolution 7 that Cherry uh, uh, put forward was kind of addressed to all the camp dis dissidents. And in our discussions uh, over at the Rainier Heat Power Building on, on Mainer, the JCL headquarters, it kind of got to the point where we had to, we had to water down the resolution so it only addressed the Heart Mountain Boys. The reasoning being, the Heart Mountain Boys answered yes, yes. And so they were, you know, they, answered, they were so-called loyal Americans. And, there was still in, this is 1990, late 90s, uh, still this idea that the no-no boys, because they answered no and oath, still had to be, you know, kept apart from the apology. They were, they were different. They were somehow less than. And um, so that, that was the actual the narrowness of that resolution that was passed in, in, in the year 2000. I finished the film before the resolution was passed, and so it kind of actually annoyed me that they passed the resolution before the film was broadcast, so I had to add that little code, that little title at the end, to explain that the JACL did apologize to the Hard Mountain Boys uh, just before the broadcast. And, um, uh, you know, JACL has yet, you know, there's still people uh, who want JACL to take further action, and boy, I, that's just a hornet's nest. But that's the story, yes. You know, I, I was in the camp, I was five five years old, yes. and I remember kind of the, the way society was, this was in Berkeley. You know, they took away, most of them. my father was an alien, they took him away, they, they, they took him away a lot of the men. The people left to resist were women and children, and you know, there wasn't, this is the most powerful government in the uh, world, and how are you going to, in 10 days, you know, we had this notice that we were going to be, in 10 days you're supposed to organize some kind of resistance, you know, it just wasn't well, like today anyway, we wouldn't have gotten, had any support, yes. so there's no way, and, and yeah, not I mean, to apologize for the JACL, but I think they were trying, they felt, they saw this situation and they thought, well, you know, working with the government would be the best. And, you know, I, I don't agree with Yes, either, I mean, but, certainly, you know, the But argument, the circumstances were impossible. If we cooperate, reasons. we'll get better treatment yeah. for the government. You know, they won't treat us too badly. We have to look out for the women and children. You know, yeah. to keep, and, and, you know, Mike Masaoka, JCL, wanted to keep families together. Yeah. So whatever concessions they could wring out of the war relocation authority, they felt was a victory. Uh, and yes, the, the FBI did immediately arrest the Issei leadership here in Seattle, took them off uh, to um, the uh, Department of Justice camps. And so there was a little bit of vacuum uh, of leadership here in Seattle, mm -hmm. West Coast, uh, in, into which people like <coughs> Clarence Arai, Jimmy Sakamoto, who were the Nisei leaders of JACL here in Seattle, have stepped in and, you know, developed the, their, their policy of accommodation, if you will, collaboration, if you will, in order to obtain better treatment. Uh, so 
as Roger Daniels says in the film, you can argue it as a political strategy, <coughs> and Roger says, you know, it's hard to defend as a, as a moral conclusion. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'll look at that. Yes, Betty. I came to relate to the number of years ago, and one of the panelists spoke about uh, 23 resistors from their town, and that they were driven to <coughs> the courthouse, and the restaurant wouldn't serve lunch. They went on to the courthouse, and that they said this is the only case where the judge ruled that they were not guilty. And he said that the judge knew it was such a hot topic that when he came in to the courtroom to give the, 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 the decision, that he left his car with the motor running. So he could make a quick escape, uh, yes. a rather yeah. extraordinary story. This is a story uh, Eric Muller captures in uh, the book, Free to Die for Their Country. Uh, and I believe that was the story of the Minidoka Idaho Resisters. Uh, and that's a true story, that's, that's a favorite story. Yes, one more question over here. Yes. With, with that book you just mentioned, one of the histories, the written histories of, of this time and what happened in the camps, because this is virtually hidden history. Yes. Th th there's, I, I don't, it's not in the textbooks, which are just, at this point, are completely dumbed down um, from my research. And are there places on the internet, even, you know, like websites and so forth that, that, that have this hidden history? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I want to direct you to my website, uh, resistors.com, mm -hmm. uh, which has um, topical information, but also uh, pbs.org slash conscience uh, is, has, we put all the documents that are in the film online with the idea that people could look for themselves and piece the story together you know, for themselves without taking my word for it, you know, here's the documentation. And so, you know, this, this was done 12 years ago, in 2000, Eric's book came out around, this, or came out around the same time. So before this, before 2000, this was still, yes, it was undocumented, it was you know, more of a hearsay kind of experience. Uh -huh. And so, anecdotal. which, yeah, anecdotal, anecdotal, that's the word, and thank you. I was a radio news reporter, I had no experience making movies, but I, what, I, I knew this had to be a film story as opposed to a radio story, and so, just really spent 10 years trying to uh, put it together with the help of some friends at Cairo TV. And what was, what, what is the name, Eric, Eric something? Really? Eric Muller. Oh. It's in the study guide that is on the chair. So it's there. It's and there, yeah, 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 Eric Muller. Uh, um, Thank you, because this is, a, this is a piece of history of America, not so pretty, that needs to be told for people to understand what is now happening. Yes. If yes. you understand what happened then, what happened since 9-11, it right. shouldn't be that terribly surprising. The, the overall history of incarceration, of course, informs, you know, helps reform, inform our response to future emergencies, crises in the U.S. The, what I noticed is that after 9-11, the, the New York Times immediately ran several pieces and references to the Korematsu case, to, to Japanese American internment, as a, as a cautionary warning against the East Coast press, the East Coast uh, politicians, uh, uh, taking too swift of an action against the uh, Arab Americans, the Islamic Americans. Uh, uh, and so that I saw as kind of a benefit you know, of the precedent, that there, there was reminders that this, we've been here before, folks, and let's think twice before we start racially profiling a whole group of people and putting and, t and talk about what they call internment camps you know or, or centers at the, at the time but that said that didn't that didn't stop the bush administration hiring halliburton and others to create the, the 